your dress made from? Do you know who made it? Do you know how it was made? Do you know where it was made? The chances are that unless you actually made what you're wearing right now, you can't answer these questions, and right now, neither can I. In this 21st century world of fast fashion, we are surrounded by things that we don't know anything about, really. There's this gulf between manufacturers and retailers. There's this disconnect that we just sort of accept as part of everyday life. And it's very easy to apply this backwards to the 18th century, to assume that because consumers today don't really know very much about the clothing that they buy and that they wear, that the same was true in the 18th century. And I'm sure that if, you, as costumers, if you talk to people that work in the, the theatre or the film world, they'll probably have this view too, that the actors that they're dressing probably don't know very much about the clothing that they're wearing. But this wasn't the case in the 18th century. In the 18th century, people were taught an awful lot more about the clothing that they wear, about the material world that surrounded them. And in this video, I'm going to delve a little bit into my research and my understanding of how we know this, how we know that 18th century people actually understood their clothing and the processes behind the making of that clothing a lot better than we do today. 300 years ago, people would have been able to answer those questions. If you accosted somebody on the streets of 18th century London, they probably would have been able to tell you who made their clothing, what it was made from, maybe even how it was made. And this is the same whether we're talking about a fine aristocrat in a royal household who was wearing Lyons and Spitalfield silk, or if we're talking about somebody who was struggling to make ends meet and was wearing second-hand and very well-mended clothing. So the phrase that I use to describe this knowledge that people had is material literacy. So essentially what I mean by this is that people could access all of this knowledge about the clothing that they saw day to day just by looking at it because they had this existing bank of awareness about how different textiles acted and moved and how garment making worked. So number one, children were taught it. So throughout all of the toys and games and children's books of the 18th century, actually knowing what stuff is made from is one of the things that is really central to what children are being taught. So one of my favourite examples of this is a book by Lady Eleanor Fenn that was published in 1783. And in this book there's this series of dialogues that children are meant to play out between them. And one of them involves the children playing at being shopkeepers and talking to each other about what they sell in their shop. One of my favourite quotes that I think really illustrates the kind of information that they are talking about comes from the draper. When you are asked what your linen is made of, answer hemp or flax. They are both plants. You know what the woollen cloths are made of. So the children are literally talking about the fibres that make up different fabrics. They're going right down to a very deep level of information about the material world around them, about their own clothes. And they're learning about this through play. At school too, children made things. So we're very familiar with the samplers that schoolgirls would stitch, but they made clothing too. I've come across hundreds of examples of dolls' garments which are perfect miniature replicas of full-size garments and which were not made by apprentice dressmakers or mantua makers but were made by daughters of the gentry, daughters of the aristocracy, dressing their own dolls. 
so they didn't rely on professional knowledge to know how their garments were made. A lot of our knowledge of girls learning how to sew also comes from letters from their school days and there are some fantastic quotes from these. One of my favourites is from a young girl called Frances Starkey and her teachers wrote home to her parents that the moment she uses a needle her hands become so warm and moist that it is with difficulty that she can proceed. Now I never said that all children or all people in the 18th century were good at sewing. Number two, people made things. Priscilla Wakefield insisted in her 1798 book, Reflections on the Present Conditions of the Female Sex, that useful needlework in every branch with complete skill in cutting out and making every article of female dress ought to employ a considerable part of the day. So although we're focused on milliners and mantua makers and dressmakers as the authors of the beautiful garments that we see in museum collections, this isn't necessarily the case. There were a lot of home dressmakers busily stitching away in the 18th century. And there isn't a hierarchy of making either. It definitely isn't necessarily the case that all professionally made garments are somehow better than those made by the amateur seamstresses of the 18th century. So it complicates a lot about the way that we look at making as a profession and making more broadly in the 18th century. So 18th century women not only knew how their garments were made, but potentially had made them themselves. People write about this in their letters, so why haven't we really taken this in yet? Catherine Hutton, for example, talks about how she made every item of women's wearing apparel for herself, other than shoes, gloves and stockings. And I think we can forgive her for that. There are letters from daughters of earls and dukes talking about garments that they have made. We know that an acquaintance of Jane Austen's netted herself a dress from Worsted's. I think that my favourite example of home dressmaking in the 18th century comes from a letter that Lady Carlo wrote to her sister, Louisa Stuart, in 1781. And she wrote... My chief amusement since I came from town has been making myself a white polonaise, in which I have succeeded to a miracle, and repent having given one to a famous mantua maker in Dublin, who spoilt it entirely for me. So again we see it's not necessarily the case that professional makers are better than amateur ones. And all of these references to homemaking are tucked away in the letters and diaries written by 18th century women. And even women like poor Frances Starkey, who would not probably have been making her own garments, would still have had a very intimate relationship with the people who did. So remember that in the 18th century, Ready-made is still a very new idea and not a very common one. So most of your garments are made specifically to you, or if they're second-hand, they're remade and pulled apart and sewn to fit your body. So there's this very intimate relationship between consumers and the people making their clothes, if indeed they are not one and the same. Number three, making was everywhere. Whether or not you wielded a needle yourself, it was surrounding you in your everyday life. Making knowledge was available to buy in shops. When Elizabeth Woodhouse was getting married in the 1790s and preparing her wedding trousseau, 
it wasn't just dresses and accoutrements for around the house that she was accumulating. She was also accumulating knowledge. And she went to her milliner and asked her to instruct her in her art. Many other retailers explicitly advertised making as a commodity that was available in their shops for a price. But making was also just everywhere for free. Visual representations of shops, how they're depicted in novels and plays, all paint this lush picture of retail spaces that were alive with the buzz of making. Henry Kingsbury's 1787 satire of the royal family visiting a milliner's shop presents making as part of a living window display. They perform the process of cutting, of stitching and decorating for a public audience. So while today consumers might never think about the busy hands that stitch the garments that they're wearing, this definitely wasn't the case in the 18th century. There were a lot more Mr Tilneys around. Do you understand the muslin, sir? If you enjoyed this video, then I can heartily recommend Material Literacy in 18th Century Britain, A Nation of Makers, which is a collection of essays that I edited with Dr Chloe Wigston smith and is being published by Bloomsbury. So I'll pop a link to that in the description, along with some other pieces that I recommend, if you wish to improve your mind through extensive reading. If you're here as part of CoCovid, then your ribbon collection code is coming up shortly. And otherwise, I really hope that you'll give this channel a subscribe, that you'll give this video a like, and look out more for a mixture of sewing and dress history very soon.